Hi everyone, thank you very much for, for having me here. Um, my name is uh, Frank Smith. I'm a developer at uh, DSTV Digital Media. There's my email address. Uh, yeah, a um, bit more about me. I've been uh, paid to write software for uh, about 10 years, and I've spent at least one year actually doing so. <laughs> uh, I started off my career writing a lot of C Sharp. ASP.NET. Uh, I then uh, made the transition to writing more and more Java when I started at uh, uh, DSTV. And um, I'm fairly new to the world of testing. I've been uh, writing tests for about four or five years. Uh, I first really got introduced to the idea of test-driven development when I read Michael Hartle's uh, Rails tutorial. And um, the first time that I made a change in production code and was absolutely certain that nothing would break and stuff broke due to test. I was like, wow, how have I been living my life? How many bugs have I introduced into code bases because I did not have uh, a test? So why do we write tests? Uh, anyone want to tell me? There will be prizes confidence. in the talk. Co confidence, okay? We write tests to, to build up confidence. Um, another thing I think we do is so that we can refactor the code with confidence, right? Um, there's another function of tests, and that is that they declare what our code does, right? So tests should be, be very declarative in nature. It is, um, for all points and purposes, a low-level description of what our code does. So today I'd like to implore you to become the butterfly that Java deserves. So there's a bit of history here. Um, I first uh, heard about the Spock framework when I was reading the Spring Boot documentation as one does and there was a little section about getting your tests to work with Spock. Well, this piqued my interest. I didn't initially uh, think anything of it, but as we wrote more and more tests at work, and I was frustrated by uh, uh, just representing data in a readable format. Uh, you know, we, we tried to, to introduce things into our tests. Who, who knows uh, Hamcrest here, right? Hamcrest is a uh, it's an anagram for matchers, and it allows you to to write better assertions in JUnit tests. Uh, we also played with things like adding fest to some of our tests. That's uh, funky assertions. I think it's the the Google guys who wrote it, but uh, uh, someone else in the team used that. It was a bit later that I was watching some videos on the Spring One YouTube channel when I saw an introduction of Spock by Peter Niederwieser, the, the, the author of the Spock framework. And I really thought, hey, maybe we should give this a try. Uh, and maybe if we ever get another Greenfields project. So we got the Greenfields project, and I gave it a go, right? Um, the first step was rudimentary, easy peasy. And then later I thought, well, we had to do testing on something that had a very deeply nested data structure. And to set up these data structures in tests was a pain, an absolute pain. You know, if you think about Java beans and stuff like that, you've got getters and setters, and you have to set and add stuff to lists, etc., etc. It would take hundreds of lines of code to actually just get test data for this test. So the original stuff that made this data structure used, uh, you know, normal JUnit tests, and we tried to, you know, uh, break the construction of test data using, I think, what's it, the test mother pattern, but it really wasn't lacquer. All right, fast forward to December last year, and I was reading a book uh, called RxJ, Reactive Programming with RxJS, by Sergei Mancia. And as part of the book, you make this space shooter game. Um, and I thought, well, it's cool to have a space shooter, but let's make a game similar to in that book to use as the subject for this talk. 
to write better tests. So here is the, the game. And that's probably the only reason this talk got accepted. <laughs> so we have this game of a butterfly uh, battling some dragonflies. And, uh, you know, that shoot lasers at you. It's not very challenging at the moment. Uh, some of the game parameters need to be tweaked. Um, and so what we'll focus on today is how to become a butterfly ourselves. So I'm going to present five tips that you can use to get your code base uh, to have more expressive tests. So to show this, a bit of a detour. Who of you have read this book, Refactoring, Improving the Design of Existing Code by Martin Fowler? All right. Every software engineer should claim to have at least read this book. <laughs> and better yet, actually read this book. So the first chapter deals with a video store that has rentals of normal movies and new releases and children's movies. It prints out statements. And it, and it gets you total. So um, Uncle Bob, in his uh, uh, web, uh, does a few episodes of The Clean Coder. And episode three functions actually has a screencast where he does this refactoring. So I went on GitHub and forked his tests, F-O-R-K-E-D, and uh, said, OK, let's see if we can introduce Groovy to that. So. The first thing I did is the, the code was just there, so I just chose Maven as the build system. So here are the JUnit tests. All right, so we've got a video store. We say, okay, cool. What he's done here is uh, he, he's made a lot of stuff to ease testing, right? So little uh, methods, setting up some known data, and all of these tests refer to that known data. Okay, great. This is still Java. What does this have to do with butterflies? So here's an extract of one test, right? So obviously all of these tests uh, uh, depend on the test data set up in some setup method. This is a very old test, but it's actually an example of, of pretty well written code. So how can we go and actually transform this into a groovy test? All right, the answer is simple. We rename the file to .groovy. And we also add some stuff for the build system. So all we need really is the ability to compile Groovy code in a test context. So if you're using Gradle, it's even easier. In Maven, we just steal uh, a little build plugin. No problem. And we just add Groovy as a test dependency. Uh, we add Groovy <laughs> as a test dependency, uh, scope test. Okay, this will allow us to take an existing uh, test and rename it. Refactor, rename file. There's not a shortcut for this because you don't do this every day. Alright, so let's look at the actual code. <laughs> and uh, zoom in on one of the tests. So, so look here, we've got a statement, we're adding rentals. So when we look at the test, okay, I have to look outside of it to see what the statement is. We don't know whether the statement has other stuff seeded. In fact, there's a customer name that's in the statement. That's not in the test. What is this, uh, what is this one over here? Well, I guess it's the amount of days that it's rented, but this certainly isn't clear, right? And the, the absolute subject under test, in this case, is the rental statement, but it's hidden all the way at the back here. There's a line literal for the actual statement, and that's horrendous. Now, I have to uh, uh, disclose that that is one of the first things that... Uh, Uncle Bob did was to make it a little bit more readable in the Java way, but uh, I've defactored it for dramatic effect. So, how can we address any of these things? Well, we'll start off by nitpicking about stuff that doesn't matter, like semicolons at the end, and taking away the public signature, right? 
all methods in Groovy are public by default. Who wants package private by default? So about 95% of valid Java syntax is valid Groovy syntax, and that makes it very easy to transition. The only two really things that you need to watch out for are array literals and lambdas. Groovy does not use Java 8 style lambdas, instead they use closures. And closures look a lot like array literals in Java. We'll come back to that later. So let's start by ut uh, utilizing some of the things that Groovy gives us. And one of the things we have here is a here doc or a multi-line string. Now, okay, great. What does this buy us? Well, imagine tests that take JSON in or spit JSON out and asserting the actual JSON payload. It's quite important to actually have this payload inside the test rather than reading it from some file. Um, Yeah, embedding JSON is very useful in this context. All right, so we've got this assert equals J unit. Uh, let's see if we can do better. So this is called a power assert. So I would like to show the power assert in action here. Oops. Um, So this is a subtle difference to what you had in your test, but let's compare these two when we have a failing test. So power asserts actually started as a feature of the Spock framework and was ported back into Groovy, into the core Groovy. And power asserts really uh, make use of Groovy's metaprogramming model to show you the exact expression that failed an assertion. And it also uh, takes this expression and uh, 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 shows every part that uh, uh, takes part in making this expression. If we go back to our old assertion from the year docs and we make this assertion fail, the reporting and tooling that we get is not as nice. Let's have a look. All right, so expected 8.0 was 9.0. It's not clear why this thing is failing from just reading this, say, in a bold report. It's not clear what expression is failing. Who here has used our good friend assert true? So the problem with assert true, let's say 1 plus 5's is greater than 3. No, it's greater than 10. This isn't true. But when this uh, assertion fails, we don't really know what fails unless we go write ourselves a nice message here. Let's have a look at this guy. And it probably will say something like condition not assertion failed error. That's all we get. Let's instead change this to a power asset. Suddenly it's much clearer what's going on. Well, I expected 1 to 6 plus 6 to be greater than 10, as one does, but it was false. So the next thing you want to do is, okay, I've heard of this Spock thing. You want to become a butterfly, right? So you go Spock light. So this is about taking your existing legacy test suite and bringing it into the Spock framework. So the first step is really easy. We change some plumbing instead of extending test case. And remember, this is a very old JUnit uh, uh, tests. Modern ones are just classes on their own using test annotation on methods. You extend the specification from Spock Lang. Maybe you have to change your setup method to the canonical Spock one. And on your test, all you do is you put a little label called expect. 
all right? Go to considered harmful. This is just a label. Spock uses these labels internally to set up the life cycle of a test. One other thing we get now is, and though this is a groovy feature, we can write method names as strings. So what this buys us is the ability to, to state in a much clearer fashion what our test entails. We don't have any restrictions like in all JUnit having to start a test with a test. We can really start to use Unicode characters if we think it's a good idea. Um, I've submitted a pull request to have a Brexit uh, at the end of a method in order to do some cleanup, but uh, they keep uh, closing and denying it. And um, the other thing we get is this good old tower assert is actually implicit within an expect or a then block. So a lot of the intent of this test is much clearer by uh, taking away some of the craft. Okay. So step three in becoming a butterfly involves writing idiomatic Spock. So back on those Spock labels, instead of taking your existing test and having one big expect statement, we can have clear given, when, and then demarcations. These labels are not just descriptive. They are used when you use Spock with mocking, which we will not look at today. If you're interested in Spock, uh, Peter Niedervies' video at Spring 1 to GX is, is very uh, informative at introducing Spock. The documentation is also uh, well written. Uh, so, okay, now we've got tests given when then. We're starting to talk more about the problem and worry less about constructing test data in order to get what we want. So the fourth step into becoming a butterfly as the adult emerges is actually going and writing a specification by example. So when we wrote the butterfly game we wanted to say what movement keys do to the butterfly. Uh, let's Okay, not a test. So here we have, can everyone read the code fine? People at the back? Okay. So what we have here is we have some unroll annotation here. So this serves, when we run the test, to actually take the examples we give and replace them into a text template and report them as individual tests. So it's quite clear let me just resize here. If someone were to write some form of, of tooling that takes this and puts it into some specification document when you build your software, now we're cooking with gas. So this is a Spock feature of writing parameterized tests, giving examples. And this is quite useful when collaborating with some business person, especially if you've distilled your tests down to the problem domain. Uh, what else is important here? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're still dependent on building some test data. This thing uses fluent builders to achieve what it does. Let me just show you uh, the game at this state. It's simply just a butterfly with movement. I think if you fire, it makes lasers. These lasers don't go anywhere. Uh, it's still early days. But this also allows you to be exhaustive. No one's going to go and write one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different tests based on the controls being pressed. But doing this allows you to be exhaustive in your test. And actually, this case in the original thing was never covered. So the implementation code could have the butterfly randomly moving when no keys are pressed and these tests would have passed. All right, so the fifth step of the maturity model when you become an adult butterfly is writing your own language. Now, a word of caution here. I think last year 
Uncle Bob wrote a blog post about make the magic go away where he says that we should stop using all this magic stuff unless we know how to do it ourselves. So the second part of this talk, you the audience get to choose your own adventure. Are we going to write a language for the video store that looks like this? I've got a statement. The customer's name is this person. They're renting Senti Awful, similar to Penny Dreadful. Seasons 1, 2 and 3 for 1, 2 and 3 days. And this is the statement that we're expecting. So, a few things to note here, right? This test is, is uh, uh, self-contained. There's nothing being referenced outside of the scope of the test. And quite potentially, someone who works at your amazing Betamax video store can take this test and understand what's going on. It can be used to collaborate with a business person. Alternatively, will we look at creating something like this? I've got a scene for this game with a butterfly at some place with some lasers and a dragonfly at some position. Uh, so, by show of hands, who votes for the video store? And butterfly? Okay, and many people abstain. Okay, so we'll do the video <laughs> store. We're professional software engineers. No, I'm kidding. Let's do it live. So I'm going to take a snapshot in time before we had builders. Uh, this one should actually do, but uh, is, oh, I can't get the command line. Never mind. All right, so let's see what we, what's going on here. So in order to ease some of the pain of data creation, we've used some Fluent Builders. Everyone here familiar with Fluent Builders? Anyone here not fl uh, familiar with Fluent Builders? OK. So a Fluent Builder basically says, uh, let's say I have some immutable object. right? Let's say the scene. I start by taking an, uh, a builder, immutable, so this builder allows me to set attributes uh, of the test data, let's say I want the dragonflies to be an empty list, and then every time I hit some method on it, it just returns the builder, sets some state on the builder until I'm ready to actually build the object. Right, this will give me a scene. And this can alleviate a lot of problems in building test data, but it is certainly not uh, the be all and end all. So, what we'd ideally like to do is copy the code from this slide, most notably just for now a scene with a butterfly in a certain position, and make this create test data for us. So, I'm going to sit down for this. <laughs> All right, so let's see what we want and work from there. <coughs> At this point in time, our scene is simply the initial scene. So here in our test, We start with what we'd like to do. So our IDE has absolutely no clue what's going on here. In fact, if we take this test data and replace our scene with the one we created in the test, at least this thing lights up because it knows there's some relationship between the two. But we don't even have a method that can return a scene for us. So let's simply go and create this method. We know that this method is supposed to return a scene from the game. And currently it returns null, so probably we're going to get a null reference exception when we pipe this through. Okay, great, all these tests fail as expected. We were testing the test. So, <clears throat> let's fake it until we make it. Let's take this initial test data that we used to have and simply return it in our method. 
One function of Groovy is that return statements are redundant. The last statement to execute in a method is the return type. Uh, but if anyone feels uncomfortable, you can put up your hand and I'll put return in here. Okay, no one. Great. All right. Look, our test works, but it's all lies. If we say uh, change the butterfly's position, uh, scene.butterfly.position x is this, this will fail because this method's not using any of the data that we're passing in. If it were this easy to write DSLs, everyone would be doing it. All right. Obviously, it's not even listening to what we're passing in here, as can be noticed by this gray closure thing saying parameter is not used. So what is a closure? A closure is basically just a bit of code that you can pass around. Groovy closures predate Java 8 lambdas and they are much more powerful and it is the basis of what a lot of the DSLs like Gradle that you may already know uses to work internally. So what we can do is we can let the IDE guide us. All right. In this case we don't even care about this, let's keep it simple. We just want a butterfly that goes to the position we give it. Okay. Obviously this method is gray and the closure isn't even run. So what we can do is we can tell this thing, well, okay, I'm going to just delegate my job to this fluent builder that we showed earlier. Okay. Well, the builder knows that it has a method called butterfly. A scene has dragonflies. Now immediately my IDE knows what we are trying to do. But the builder has no method that takes a closure itself and does stuff with the closure. So let me just show a immutable physical entity dot create butterfly at 3f 3f. Right? Just because we told the IDE that we will be using this closure on the builder doesn't mean we're actually doing it. So step two is to stop lying. We make an instance of this fluid builder. Immutable. Okay. Now what we need to do is a closure can run on an object. And the object we'd like this closure to run on is obviously this builder. So we set its delegate to the builder. Then we run the code in the closure and this is a shorthand for that and then finally we simply return the scene being built and oh the test is failing because the butterfly is not at 0 f but this assertion finally passed. Okay, now our DSL is starting to become a real DSL. But we have some problem. We don't actually want builders anywhere here. So we would like a way to go and give a closure to the butterfly method. But this builder doesn't have a butterfly method that takes that. So what we need to do is we need to make our own builder. scene builder. Well, this clause doesn't exist. And we'd like it to have more or less the same method signature as uh, the fluent builder that already got generated for us. So the second thing I'd like to show you in the audience that already know Groovy is our good friend Delegate. So if I have a immutable scenes builder it's very important not to use implicit typing when you use the at delegate annotation. So what does this do? This basically says that all of the public methods on this class 
should be exposed on this class. It does something called an AST transformation. So if we go back to our test, and we simply go back to the form where we supplied something that exists, this should still work. Let's verify that. Okay, great. There's still nothing that takes a position. Let's imagine that this closure could take a position and immutable vector 2D dot of 0F, 0F. Okay. You'll see that this method does not exist on our scene builder yet. So what we do is we create a method that can take a closure. Takes a closure. Butterfly spec. Or we can just call it closure if we want to be not fancy. Alright. Now if we go back to the tooling, you'll see that this method that was purple now becomes yellow. And the IDE knows. Oh, okay. This is where we're going. Great. So we just fake it. We fake it until we make it. So let's start off by just taking a another boulder. Def butterfly equals mutable physical entity dot boulder dot position. We're still lying dot bold and let's just return this butterfly. Ooh, cannot build scene, some of the requirement. Oh, and obviously we need to take the scene builder and call the underlying scene builder and make the butterfly uh, that we've just built. Oh, it's already built. And because this is a fluent builder, we should be in the game. It's a problem with live coding. Okay, we're still in the game. Alright, how can we improve this DSL? Well, I actually don't care that the position sits on a butterfly. I actually just want to say x0, y0 for all points and purposes. So, what we do is we delegate this thing to a new builder. We'll make a butterfly builder. And the nice thing about the delegate annotation is you can actually have multiple delegates and have multiple classes methods fronted by yourself. So the first thing we'll take the physical entity, the physical entity builder, physical entity dot builder. Uh, no, sorry, we want an instance, and we have to set an explicit type. Our IDE can help us with that, and we're also going to have a position built for us. Go ID, figure it out. All right. In this case, we want to override the build method. The first thing we'd like to do is we'd like to take our physical entities builder, set its position to the vector builders method, and then return the physical entity itself. So we've just collapsed some stuff on our uh, on our interface. So one thing left to do is to tell our IDE that we'll be using our new and fancy butterfly builder when a closure comes in here. We're not using this closure yet, but let's see if our tooling is happy. 
you'll see the gray stuff has now become white, which means that we know exactly where this goes and what it does. Right? This is simply the build method, like we all know. All right. The only thing left is a butterfly builder to actually go and do its job. So that would be in the scene builder. When we actually use the butterfly builder, we want to stop lying. Right? So once again, we want to delegate this builder to the closure. So we say closer delegate equals the butterfly builder. Name this guy to have a proper name. We run the closure and we say builder dot butterfly is the butterfly builder dot build. Let's see where we are with this. Fingers crossed, never live code for a conference. 